design? Have you ever wanted to know what are the questions that would actually build more meaningful connections? Well, I am so excited to have my guest Joe here today. He's written a book. He has created more than 10,000 hours of audio content. Joe, so excited to have you here today. Ditto, Amy. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Joe, can you share, you know, we're here today on Power to the People Pleasers. The listeners are individuals who find themselves sometimes putting themselves last. What would you say you resonate with when it comes to that? Well, uh, m basically my entire life, I dealt with talent working in New York radio. So uh, people pleasing was basically job one. And one of the things that has carried over later on in my career is the fact that once you learn the ability to work with quote unquote talent, whether it's high profile on air personalities or high profile business people, they all have expectations. And if you can meet or exceed those expectations, that's how you succeed in, in life. A lot of people will be like, oh, a people pleaser when you're dealing with talent, that means you're a yes person. That means you're a gopher. It's like, it's really not. That's like the simple things. Mm -hmm. And if like if so if like a leader feels like that's important maybe that's not the leader for you but most leaders i feel and and people that are you know high profile high net worth they want to make sure that all of their needs are met so if you can meet uh, meet those needs and go above and beyond on that that's how you have a distinguished career working with talent i mean i i survived 20 years working with two individuals that were high profile ones in like the rock and roll hall of fame. And yeah. I was their longest lasting producer in their lifetime. Like, I, and, and it wasn't because I was better than anybody else. It was just that mm -hmm. I, I sort of knew the key to pleasing people and, and doing what it took to accomplish the goal of creating a great morning show. And so for, mm -hmm. for that, could, that could be for other people, it could be other things, you know, building a company, uh, having a great family environment, having a good team, but for me, it was that. But I think that also resonates for all those other realms. Yeah. And and so you wrote this book, Good Listen, helping people have memorable conversations. Can you tell me a bit more about this book? Yeah. So I was never a book bucket list person. You know how you always run into someone <laughs> and it's like, oh, man, it's always been a re it's always been a wish in my life to write a book. I never really thought I'd have a life worthy of a book. So as I mentioned, I worked in terrestrial radio for a couple decades in New York, and the radio station I was working uh, at was sold, and they blew it up in, in radio parlance. They basically they, they, they blew up the, the radio station. They flipped it to a new format. And so when I was looking for new opportunities, I joined this company in Charleston, South Carolina called Advantage Forward Books, which is a publishing company that works with entrepreneurs, CEOs to get their books published. And as I started working with them, they wanted me to sort of launch their podcast platform. So they, they had books, they had marketing. So they wanted to have someone who can help, help people that were sort of novices or new to podcasting and help them become podcasters. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why, I took a lot of the skills that I had acquired during my years in radio for granted. Like I just mm -hmm. automatically assumed like the things I could do, other people can do. And not and and I only knew, found out that wasn't the case when I started working with these people that had never worked in a radio studio before, or worked in a media market, or had any kind of front-facing position in, in in life. So all of these things started coming together, and I went to the powers that be uh, at at our publishing company, and it's that old adage that you probably hear comedians when they talk to each other. They're like, "Is this a thing?" And so I went to the folks and I said, is this a thing? Is this, could, could this be a book that could help people? And they're saying, yeah, this is a thing. And so that's how it really came about. All of the, the stories and anecdotes that I use in the book are stuff that I was using every day to share with mm -hmm. folks that I was coaching and consulting to be podcasters. And it was really, you know, I, I don't want to sound cocky or, or overconfident. It was a really quick write because it was basically all of these memories were so fresh in my mind, even though some of them date back 20, 21 years, I was like, this is th these stories can help people. And I use a lot of celebrities and I don't mean it to be like this gross, like name dropper, but a lot of the, the interactions I had with these celebrities, I learned a lesson from. And I feel mm -hmm. if I can learn something from it, the folks who I share the story with can possibly take something away from it. And also everybody loves a good celebrity story. And so it was great to incorporate those in the book. I love that. So can you, can you share one of the stories? I'd love to know. I'd love to know. Absolutely. So one of the, the tips I give for folks when it comes to 
um, becoming great at communicating, becoming a better conversationalist is creating an environment of, of, of safety, having a safe place is an overused term these days, but I'm going to use it in this, in this case of creating an environment where people can share ideas, where it's not just one person talking and another person listening and vice versa. It's a conversation and exchange of ideas. And it's important to do that. And there's so many different ways to do it. I write about it in the book. But the reason I bring it up in this case is that we had Taylor Swift come into our studio one time. I'm not sure if you're familiar. She's a musician. And uh, <laughs> she she came in to uh, promote one of her latest albums. And she walks in the studio. But before she walked in, there were some rules that were laid down by her, her PR team. And it was an odd request. So as you know, a lot of uh, radio and TV s- stations will record behind the scenes footage or the interview and then share with social media public. Well, for some reason, the PR team said, okay, you guys can video record this this radio interview and then share it on social media under one condition. You can only record the first five minutes of the interview. Now, mind you, not five minutes of the interview, the first five minutes. And as anyone knows, and we could talk about this today, Amy, is the first five minutes of any conversation are usually the worst. It's usually yeah. just... Small talk, getting people warmed up, getting them ready to open up, creating that space. And so yeah. I was like really annoyed by this. You know, maybe my ego got the best of me, but it just really drove me crazy that we had this opportunity to have this big, huge star, one of the biggest names on the planet, and we could only share five minutes of the worst part of the interview. So Neil say Taylor Swift comes in the studio, the PR person walks over, and the videographer is standing a few feet away from me. PR person makes a beeline straight to uh, the videographer, says, hey, by the way, just a reminder, at the five-minute mark, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder, and I need you to put down the camera. Like, they, they didn't even trust us to, like, hit stop record or take it. Like, literally, like, take the, the camera and put it down. And for some reason, this was all stewing inside of me and bubbling inside <laughs> of me of, like, how annoyed I was about this. So as the PR person says this, I say to her, oh, just a quick question. Um, if we have a follow-up question at the five minute mark, can we continue recording just so we can make sure we capture that? And like, yeah, I'm sure we'll see what we can, we'll see what happens. And then I said, well, what if we had a follow-up question to that follow-up question? Would we still be able to keep recording? And at this point, the PR person's like, has no idea how to answer this. And of course (laughs) I can't leave well enough alone. So I say, what if we have a follow-up question to the second follow-up question that ties together with the first follow-up question? Would we be able to keep recording? And at that moment, a disembodied voice from across the studio says, well, somebody woke up feeling saucy this morning, and it was Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift had heard this whole interaction. I didn't think in a thousand years she was listening to me on the other side of the room talking to her publicist. She was with, she had one of her friends with her. She was talking to the other members of the show. And so for, because of the fact that I didn't create this safe place, I didn't make this environment feel safe for her. It was a terrible interview. She had the walls put up during the entire conversation. She was worried that this jerk who was being a, a bit of a dick to her PR people were was going to ask an offensive or, or an inappropriate question. And so mm-hmm. I learned from that. And I share that in the book that my ego got in the way because instead of me worrying about creating this, this place where Taylor Swift could exchange ideas and have a great conversation with our team, it became a stilted, run-of-the-mill uh paint by the numbers kind of uh kind of interview that just was kind of just blah and so we didn't get any video that was worthwhile but on top of that we didn't really make great content because i was so worried about getting this video instead of me worrying what was the most important thing was creating this environment where we could have this really cool conversation and so I think that's a takeaway that I, I preach all the time when it comes to folks. And, you know, like I joke, like the first five minutes of every conversation are terrible. Well, you've got to take a conversation like the hotel pool. You ever go to the hotel pool when you first walk in, it's at two feet, and then you slowly but surely walk into the deep end of the pool. That's really what a conversation's like. So the early parts of a chat are the, how you doing? What's going on in life? How's the weather? And then you slowly but surely work your way into the deeper end of things. And I think that's the way you have to treat having a conversation in my case, it was a radio interview, but when you're having a conversation at work or with, with a, a family member or an important conversation that could be important to your job, it's important to be able to create that place where ex- ideas can be exchanged and people can be thoughtful and free and, and just carefree when it comes to uh, speaking to another person. So 
what I'm hearing you say was your ego got, ego got in the way. What if you were reliving that situation again with Taylor Swift, what would you have, what would you do differently? I would not have, I honestly would have ignored the video component of it. Like to mm. me, it, 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 since it was so secondary, like to us in radio, we had a couple million listeners every day. I mean, sure, maybe the video would have gone viral or something like that. But at the end of the day, our audience wasn't served correctly. Like I didn't, mm. we're as, as hosts and interviewers, you were the avatar for the audience. And I just was not that person. I, I just made it all about me. And so that's, that. I think that's what I learned most of like, hey, listen, I should have just shut out. And that's why I tell people, like when you're having a, a big conversation where you're doing a podcast, shut everything else off, turn off your phones, make sure every notification on your computer or phone is turned off or, or silent because you want to be able to be 100% focused. And that's why I love podcasting. I'm sure this is why you love it too, Amy. At in what point in your life will you ever have a one hour, 30 minute, 45 minute uninterrupted conversation with another human being? It just doesn't happen anymore. And the old adage of, you know, one podcast equals five first dates is true because there's no way you can ever connect with a person in, in outside of podcasting like you do. But you can be intentional about that in your everyday mm -hmm. life, just like we're podcasting. We're 100 percent focused on each other right now, Amy. And that's how if you really want to get your point across, change people's minds, make an impact on people's lives, you have to be able to be 100 percent focused in that moment and shutting out the noise. I love that. I really love that. And that is so applicable for all of all of the people that who would be listening to this, right? It's in your home life, in your work life, finding more ways, committing to more mm. time being focused on individuals. I can think of a time where I had an opportunity to speak with what I would consider a pretty influential woman. And it meant so much to me that when she was with me for those few minutes, she was looking me in the eye, even though there was like a queue of people right around us waiting their, their turn and, and wanting to get in there. She was looking at me. She was a hundred percent in the conversation with me. I think that shows a lot of leadership and character. So thank you for sharing that. So when you think about, you know, I want to spiral from that that conversation with Taylor and and getting into these asking better questions mm -hmm. what are some examples then when we're trying to create that space of of comfort and openness so you can have a real conversation what are some of the questions that you teach your people to use absolutely one of the things is preparation preparation for any conversation whether it's an interview, whether it's something at work, whether it's it's even whether it's even like a family member, um, research and preparation for that conversation goes a long way. And what I mean by that is people all love to talk about themselves. And mm -hmm. so if you know something about them that they may have forgotten or something they've done that they're proud of and you bring that up, there's no better way to getting into someone's good graces than telling them, oh, by the way, I love that thing you wrote on LinkedIn. Oh, that, that picture you posted with your family, oh my God, your, your family's unbelievable. Those kind of little things by j just doing a bit of preparation, like not, you don't have to spend hours or weeks preparing for a conversation that you're gonna have, but just spending a few minutes Googling someone. You know, uh, I'm not single, I uh, haven't been for a very long time, but the one thing I remember that a lot of folks used to do is when you go on dates is you would Google them, right? You'd check out their, their background, see what they posted. Why can't we do that when it comes to having a big conversation with someone at work, having a, doing a podcast, like just a simple, um, just a simple, the simple step of just d looking up basic research of a, another human being. And for a lot of times when it comes to work or when it comes to like just meeting people in your life, it's so easy to find information on people. And I think that triggers sort of that safety place. We're like, oh my God, these people were so curious about me that they went out of their way to look this up or find this little thing. That's why, Amy, if you ever watch a, a, a morning television show or even late night talk show and they do this and it's at this point, it's become kind of a tired bit. But how many times do you ever see them pull up from like an actor who's been working for like 20, 30 years? They pull up their first TV commercial that they ever did when they were like 10 years old and they drop that in the middle of it. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, I can't believe you found that. I haven't seen that in 20 years. And it just opens up the person to like. Oh, I remember when I was doing that, my mom took me to school that day and then I went to shoot the, and so 
why can't we do that in normal life? Like, why? I mean, obviously, we didn't all film a TV commercial when we were kids or something like that, but just finding information about other people. I tell this to folks, uh, you know, we just got over the holiday season. And when people say, like, how do I interact with my family members who I haven't seen in months or don't really like to yeah. talk to? Just check out their <laughs> Facebook page or their Instagram, pull up something because nothing feeds the ego more than telling someone you saw it on social media. Everyone mm. loves it. Like if you, Amy, if I said to you, Amy, boy, I love that photo or that post you did on LinkedIn. You deep, the, your endorphins will go off the charts. Like you'd be like, mm. oh my God, yeah, really? It's like, it's, it's really sort of comparable to if you run into a celebrity on the street and say, hey, I love that movie you did or you love that TV show. That is such an endorphin rush for human beings. And I think we can all do that. It doesn't have to be a celebrity or someone who's well re world renowned. It could be someone as simple as your next door neighbor or your coworker or or a job interview you're about to go for. And look up the interviewer. Look to, look up to see what they've posted and shared in the world, and bring that up in conversations. And and when it comes to people pleasers, knowing more about the people you're trying to please, that's the easiest way to please people. Because if you know where they're coming from or wh wh what their history is like or what their background is like. That just makes your job exponentially easier because you know this human being inside out. And I think if we all did that in our everyday life, and I'm not saying we have to Google every person we speak to, but if we're that thoughtful and intentional about really being curious about another human being, I think that's where you can really help and make an impact and really create like magic moments in conversations with folks that you probably would never had. Yeah, I, I'd love to know, What's an example of a magic moment that you've created for someone? Oh boy. Um, I will say, you know, in my radio days, it happened a lot, but I, I will say that one of the things that I've always noticed with, with uh, folks in, in the media, they love it when you go way back into their life, but they also mm -hmm. love it when you talk about something that's going on right now. So for example, mm -hmm. I'm a New York Jets fan, and if anyone watching or listening to this is a, a knows football, the Jets are usually pretty bad. Um, so a few <laughs> years ago, uh, and of course, they just wrapped up another bad season. But a few years ago, I um, interviewed Jesse James Decker, who's a real reality TV star, country singer. She's married to James Decker, who at the time was a football player for the New York Jets, played wide receiver, had a really good like 1,000-yard receiving season. Uh, but during this time of the conversation, the Jets were, again, really bad. And what I did in, in that moment was I shared something about myself that mm -hmm. opened up Jesse to share something about her and Eric. And in this case, I talked about how Jesse, as Jet fans, it drives us crazy when we're watching a football game, our hearts are ripped out of our chest. And then at the end of the game, the players are smiling, hugging, they're glad handing the, the, the team that just kicked their butt and it drives us crazy. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, like, how does Eric take this? How does Eric, who who had a very successful career, he was with the Broncos. I think he won a Super Bowl. I, you know, what's what's it like being in part of this world where you're just constantly losing and being beaten down? And because I shared that, she shared something that I never thought she would. She talked about the fact that he was suffering from depression. When he got home, he went straight to his bedroom and closed the door and wanted to be left alone. And I don't think she would have shared that if I had not shared where I was coming from. So just the idea of like sharing something about yourself can create magic moments without having to know so much about the other person, because I think people want to find that connective tissue. And sometimes to find that you've got to share a bit of yourself. And mm -hmm. in many cases, that's what I do. I always bring myself into a conversation when I coach and consult people. I say, call this an interview for shorthand, but I don't like the term interview. I always key on the phrase. Yeah conversation because a conversation is two people sharing ideas interviews question answer question answer question answer there's a million ways to do that that are really boring and can be done with a robot these days <laughs> but a conversation <laughs> yeah. is two human beings sharing ideas and that's and and the way you create magic moments is sharing your thoughts sharing your background sharing the history you've had and i think mm -hmm. that's what actually can create a magic moment is when two people are in the same boat it's that alchemy it's that chemistry that created by, by two people that two people sharing things, that's how you create magic moments. I love that. And I want to recap. So you shared that in order to ask better questions, number one, do some research to, to you know, pull up some things that you can talk about, right? I really like that you said that because 
So often people get hung up on finding the perfect question when essentially you're just asking, asking them to go deeper on something they've already put out into the world, right? So that's kind of like the keep it simple model, right? Keep it simple by helping yourself. I love that. And I also like this idea that you're sharing around being vulnerable and opening up and sharing a bit about yourself, right? Uh, I do, I can relate to that. When you share a bit of your heart, people lean in more. They, they're they open to, again, sharing their heart as well. So I, I think those are two really key things. Is there something you wanted to add to that as well? I don't know what happened, but your microphone stopped. Well, I apologize. My dog started uh, chewing on a Frisbee and I muted it. Um, no, uh, in the book, uh, Amy, I mentioned the four ways to ask right questions. And again, this is not science, but it's really the way I sort of look at things. And you know, when it comes to asking the right questions, Amy, start with positivity. You can get yeah. into negative and dark places later on in the conversation. It's going back to what we talked about later, earlier in the conversation about just like starting really slow. So starting with positivity, starting with these moments we've been talking about, digging up, digging up something in their past and making them feel really safe and feel like the person that they're having a conversation with is there for them. Uh, the second yeah. thing is focus on open ended questions because nothing drives me crazier than yes, no questions. There's just no, it's, it's like the worst thing in the world. <laughs> And so if you ever get caught up in that, it, and if it is sort of one of those questions that has to be yes, no, always say, so if it's so if it's yes, why do you think it's yes? Or if it's no, why do you think it's no? I think that's super important for folks to be able to make sure that a conversation has that kind of give and take and pull. Because if a person says no or yes, it's like, okay, let's do this again. Let's try the next question. Um, no one. <laughs> the other thing is make people feel important. And this sort of ties back to what we spoke about earlier about the positivity, having questions. If you make that person feel important, like that and that moment, that's all you care about is having this conversation. That will th make things go a long way. And finally, mm -hmm. choose questions that are going to drive a conversation, Amy. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to ask questions for the sake of asking questions. Uh, I think it's, it's real. I know it's kind of, it's a silly thing to say because it's like, oh yeah, well, of course you have to ask questions, but like, make sure those questions are coming from a place where of curiosity. I mean, curiosity is like the big thing. It's a big thing in my life. It's a big thing I talk about in the book, Amy, I'm sure it's a big thing with you. It's like, we are, we are so uncurious. I don't even know if that's a word anymore. We're so in our own exactly. silos. Sure. Let's make it one. Now, Amy. Hey, We're so good. into our own world where we just want to be we want this feedback loop of the same thing we know and understand. But the more we can be curious about other people, I think that's how we can become better human beings. I think that's the problem with today. I think mm -hmm. now we have channels and tribe. Like the one thing I talk about, tribe and tribal. Like it's great to be part of a tribe, but the, the idea of being tribal, it's you all you want to do is just stick with your tribe and do nothing but the tribe. It's important to have that tribe. I, I totally understand that people need to have that support system, but you can't have a tribal attitude of being like, we're, we're right, you're wrong, everyone else is terrible, yeah. we're the best people on the planet. So I think that's what sort of drives the discourse that we're all kind of experiencing now in North America and across the world, um, because we just don't want to, we don't care what the other person's experiencing. We all think that other person is either cr crazy, nuts, they don't know what they're talking about, they're dumb, they're uneducated, but no. We don't we don't know any of the real answers as to why these people feel that way, because we don't care to know what they feel and why they feel that way. So I think curiosity is a big driver. And for people pleasers, you can't be a people pleaser unless you're curious, because you'll never be able to please a person because you never know what, what's going to take to please them. Um, so yeah. uh, if you don't have that curiosity, like bone in your body, you're going to have to find it or otherwise you might have to find another line of work. Cause I just think there's for anyone to succeed in this world, you have to want to know more about other people, other things. And so, uh, you know, as kids, we drive our parents crazy by saying, why we do that? What's that for? What's that for? And we lose that because we're afraid. We're so afraid yes. to ask questions, but I think we need to stop being afraid. And I know sometimes mm -hmm. people say, well, I feel uh, I'm worried about being inappropriate or, or asking the wrong question, ask wrong question. But I say to that is, well, is the question, is the question you're asking coming from a good place? Is it just coming yeah. from a state of curiosity? Then it can't be inappropriate. I mean, obviously some people may take things different ways, but if you're coming at it from a good place from yourself, then there's, you know, the, how the other people take it. It's like, Hey, listen, 
I'm not being a bad person. I'm not being negative. I'm just really curious about this one thing. Um, so as long as your questions are coming from that good place, I don't think there's such thing as an inappropriate or, or offensive question. Uh, it's really how you frame it, how you're coming at it, being positive from the start. And that's how you're able to, to get the most out of people. I love that. I love that, Joe. I really have enjoyed our conversation and I'd love to, to invite you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share as we, we wrap up our conversation today? Yeah, yeah. One thing I've really gotten into lately, Amy, is failure. And I work with a lot of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and I think you know this as well as I do. There's been a thousand books recently about embracing <laughs> failure and, uh, and like loving failure. And, I, and that's all well and good. But I think the problem is that I think sometimes folks feel like they have to learn from every failure. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's the case. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, especially when it comes to being a, a good conversationalist or being a people pleaser, sometimes you just fail and there's no lesson to be learned from it. There's that famous meme from the office that, that's been going around. But I think it's really important. And I've been telling people that. And, and, the, and the reason I'm bringing this up is um, I used to get asked all the time, like, what do you do after a bad show? Like, do you do you do you uh, do you have like a, a confab afterwards where you talk things out and find out why? And I say sometimes, yeah, but sometimes you kind of have to live like a hockey goaltender. And my boss <laughs> used to tell me this all the time. Sometimes you just the puck goes in the net and you can't take it out. It's a goal. It is what it is. You you played the perfect defense. You, you, you did everything right. But sometimes the other team scored on you. And I think that's how people need to start uh, embracing failure in that way where not everything's a lesson, not everything, you know, in this conversation we're having today, Amy, like not everything people, are people are going to take away from it. And some people are going to try things and they're going to film like, what did I do wrong? It's like, it's okay. We all fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to love failure, embrace failure, that's cool. But just so you know, you don't always learn everything from every failure, because if that was the case, man, we wouldn't be repeating history left and right. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last, like, wait a minute, why are we going through this? What, in Brazil, they're raiding the capital as we're recording this? It's like, wait a minute, didn't we learn from this before? No, no, we didn't. And so I think it's one of those things where, um, sure, embrace failure, but sometimes you have to just chalk it up for, you know, the other team gets paid to score too. Yeah. I, I Thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. I'm glad that you did. So how can the listeners connect with you following this podcast? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm very, uh, I don't know if this is a word either. Amy, I'm famous for making up words, but I'm very Googleable. Uh, so if you <laughs> Google me, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, my book, Good Listens, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, anywhere digital uh, books are sold. And uh, you can get the the paperback, you can get the ebook, and you can also get the audiobook. So if I haven't driven you crazy over the last 27 minutes and would like to listen to my voice, read you the book for several hours, feel free to download the audiobook from Audible. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you were hilarious. Well, it's been uh, a pleasure connecting with you today and, and learning more about creating these awesome connections. And I invite our listeners to tune in for the next episode of Power to the People Pleasers. Have a great day.